Hi there, this is Dr. John Bergser from the St. Paul Center for Biblical Theology. And we're answering questions today. We got one question in particular here from M.S.H. Burnett. He says, or she says, I am studying theology in the Anglican Church. Where in the Bible is the description of the Holy Trinity? I have read many places where the Holy Spirit and God the Father and Jesus are mentioned, but not specifically the word Trinity. This is a great question, and the simple answer is the word Trinity is not in the Bible. However, the reality of the Trinity is in the Bible in many places. Think, for example, of the Great Commission at the end of Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew 28, at the end of that chapter where our Lord commands the apostles to go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. The name is a huge theological concept in Judaism. So the fact that baptism is taking place in the name of all three, Father, Son, and Spirit, would indicate the co-equality of those three persons, that they are each of divine status. It's not true just there, but in many other places in the New Testament. For example, in 2 Corinthians 13, 14, we read, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Uh, just the fact that a divine blessing is, in, is invoked here in the name of all three persons indicates a co-equality. If any one of them were not divine, it would be in a certain sense, mildly blasphemous to include them along with the other divine person or persons in this concluding blessing that St. Paul invokes on his readers. The word Trinity is a word that we had to develop later in the church's history. It really means a tri-unity. The unity is in the divine nature, the tri-ness or the threeness. And, but but MSH Burnett, that is a good question that you bring up. Is it uh, permissible to use non-biblical language in our theology? And that was a question for the early church. So when we, when we look at the early councils and the councils of, of the 300s, like uh, Nicaea and Constantinople, and then later in the 400s at Chalcedon, some of the early bishops protested about terms like the Trinity and said, we should not use language that's not found in the scriptures themselves. However, the consensus of the church was, you know what, it is okay to come up with terms for realities that we find in scripture, even if in scripture itself, there's not a specific term for that reality. So uh, to to say otherwise is really to commit a form of what we call a word-thing fallacy. That is, the idea that a thing is not present if the word is not being used. And it's easy to demonstrate uh, the truth of this fallacy. For example, uh, ancient people did not have a word for electricity. Does that mean that electricity did not exist in the ancient world? Well. Obviously it did. Every time a lightning bolt struck the ground, that was electricity. They didn't know that. They would call it light or they would call it fire. The ancient Hebrews called it torches in the sky. Um, they didn't, again, did not have a word for electricity, but the reality of electricity was present there and only later do we develop terms for it. Well, theology and scripture is the same. There are realities there and the church permits us to come up with new terminology to more accurately describe the spiritual realities that are present in the sacred text. James Williams asks a great question. Why did the transfiguration matter in the Bible? What was the main significance? Well, James, clearly it was just Jesus showing off his superpowers. Really? Look what I can do. <laughs> no. <laughs> Come on, Joe. I wondered this for a lot of my life as well. And actually, the Lord gave me some insight into the significance of the transfiguration when I was actually leading a pilgrimage in the land of Israel and was on top of Mount Tabor 
in the Basilica of the Transfiguration. And my guide put me on the spot and uh, told me I was gonna have 10 minutes to tell everybody about the Transfiguration, and so I better get ready. So I had about three minutes to prepare a 10 minute talk on the Transfiguration. I myself was a little bit uncertain of its significance, but meditating on scripture, quickly praying to the Holy Spirit, it dawned on me that really what we have going on in the Transfiguration is an anticipation of Calvary. Think of the comparison between Mount Tabor and Mount Calvary. In both cases, we have our Lord being lifted up and surrounded by two figures. So in the Transfiguration, he's lifted up and surrounded by two saints, Moses and Elijah. At Calvary, he's lifted up and surrounded by two sinners, uh, the two thieves. Um, in both cases, Jesus is being glorified, but at Mount Tabor, Peter, James, and John are given the privilege to see it with their physical eyes. At Calvary, the glory of our Lord is profoundly even greater than his glory revealed on Mount Tabor. However, at Calvary, it requires the eyes of faith to look at that scene with our Lord lifted up on the cross and realize that it's a demonstration of the greatness of God, a God who is so great that he is able to take on our human weakness and defeat sin, death, and the, and the devil through accepting death. Wow, that is mind-blowing. That is a great God who can do that. Tony asks a great question. Why does the Catholic Church bow daily to statues? Isn't that like bowing down to idols? Okay, Tony, I can totally sympathize with you because before I became a Catholic, I thought there was a lot of bowing down to statues as well. But actually, now that I am a Catholic, I realize there isn't so much. We don't bow to statues in mass. We rarely use statues in formal worship, etc. What you will see, Tony, and what I witness as well, is people kneeling in front of a statue of a saint uh, to pray. So first of all, let's clarify the kneeling bit is not to the statue, because a statue isn't magic or anything. The kneeling bit is just to pray. The kneeling is to God. It's a sign of humility and reverence to God. So people kneel to pray in the presence of the statue. Now, what's the statue doing there? The statue is a reminder of the presence of a holy person, a saint, um, a disciple of Jesus, who's gone ahead of us, who's passed on to the next life, and is in heaven now. As Christians, we believe that those who die in the Lord go to be with the Lord, as St. Paul says. And they're not dead, they're still alive. And we are connected to those saints in heaven through the Holy Spirit. So we can ask them to pray for us, just like we would ask a friend down here on earth to pray for us when we're going through something difficult. So Chi E asks a great question. Uh, he or she says, I desire to understand the Catholic Church's point of view about speaking in tongues. Many of my friends believe everyone should and is meant to have the gift from the Holy Spirit. Can you please explain and recommend a book that brings clarification? Uh, I am a former Protestant and I used to rub shoulders frequently with charismatic Christians who, uh, like the friends referred to in the question, insisted that everybody had to speak in tongues. But that actually contradicts scripture. St. Paul makes the point that not everybody has the gift of speaking in tongues. Uh, in his discussion in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 of different spiritual gifts that are dispensed by the Holy Spirit, uh, St. Paul actually ends his discussion with a Retor a set of rhetorical questions in, again, this is 1 Corinthians 12, 29. He says, are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, do all work miracles, do all possess gifts of healing, do all speak with tongues, do all interpret? And the implied answer to all of these rhetorical questions is no, not everybody is an apostle, not everybody is a teacher, and not everybody speaks in tongues. So the position of the Catholic Church is pretty simple. We just follow what St. Paul teaches here. The Catholic Church is open to the supernatural gift of speaking in tongues, and there is a Catholic charismatic movement and those who foster that gift of speaking in tongues, but it is not required for all, and it is not a necessary sign of your holiness. Except for you, Joe, because you have to speak in them. So how long am I going to purgatory then, since... 
Uh, I think the book of Revelation says three days for you. Well, these have been some awesome questions. Uh, thank you so much to the questioners who sent those in. And uh, we have further resources down in the description box. I know I dealt with these really quick in just two minutes, three minutes, but there's good answers and more in-depth answers in the resources that we put down there. So check those out and go deeper in your faith. Also, please subscribe to these videos. We'd love it if you did that. And if you have some additional questions that were not asked by somebody else in these videos, then put those questions in the comments below and we will try to pick them up and do some future videos answering your questions. This has been Dr. John Bergsma from the St. Paul Center for Biblical Theology.